please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 10 as we continue our teaching series, Future Church. We are, as Gerald said, gearing up to regather on the other side of, or kind of, sort of, two-thirds of the way through a global pandemic, upstairs in the not-too-distant future at all. But as we wait just a few more weeks, we really sense that it's time to dream again as a church about the kind of followers of Jesus and the kind of community that we want to emerge on the other side of COVID-19 as. Up on the docket for today is a community of orthodoxy and a culture of ideological idolatry. Please stand with me for the reading of scripture. We stand to honor God. We stand under his loving authority over our mind and our body and our whole life. And to honor the text that we are about to read as God breathed. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be. Towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every single thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take a seat. Have a look at the following images from the Capitol riot on January 6th. Notice the man praying to the cross, the man in black with the Holy Bible, the Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president, flag in the wind. Just moments before a police officer was beat to death with a flagpole, our former vice president and many others were hunted in the hallways of Capitol Hill and the peaceful transition of power was upset for the first time in our nation's 244-year history. What are we to make of the use of Christian symbols and language for an act of violence that was so blatantly unchristian? Now, I imagine that right now you are feeling a cocktail of emotions based on where you come from, anger at them, or at me, how dare you say that? Contempt, I'm so much better than. Grief, a lot of us just feel like a sorrow. Embarrassment or even doubt over your Christian identity. A lot of us feel like if that's what a Christian is, I want nothing to do with that, I'm out. Those are valid feelings. Paul writes about those who bring the way of truth into disrepute those in the church. As a group of pastors said in a statement last week on the Capitol riots, quote, there is a version of American nationalism that is trying to camouflage itself as Christianity and it is a heretical version of our faith. But nothing I said was very offensive in this room. Some of you listening online from other parts of the country, you're done now. But that's not very offensive here at all. But the same could be said for the left as well. Portland, as you know, is one of the most politically homogenous cities in the world. There is very little diversity of thought here. So it's very easy for us to miss all of the ways that we have been swept up in the culture wars, even as followers of Jesus. Take a look at a few more, more tender for us images. Notice the use of the cross 
and a heart the symbol of love to argue for killing the unborn, at a numerical level, the greatest genocide of our time. Or the pride flag flying in front of a church steeple. Or the new trend that's very popular right now in the mainline churches in town of the rainbow used for the clerical collar which if you know the history of the clerical collar, it's not from our church tradition. I don't have to wear one, thank God. Um, but the t-shirt is a little bit more our style. But with great respect in the Anglican and the Catholic tradition and a few others, it was designed to set the pastor or the priest apart from the world. It was a visible sign to everyone. This is someone who's chosen a different way of life and it was white to symbolize holiness and specifically in the Catholic tradition to symbolize the priest's celibacy. That this was a man who chose to give up all expression and enjoyment of human sexuality and even the intimacy of marriage in order to consecrate himself and dedicate himself to serving God by serving the church. What are we to make of that symbol of all things now turned into a symbol for, in all honesty, something very unchristian? What are you feeling now? I'm sure another set of emotions. Shocked? Like, how dare, you, you're not allowed to say that in public. Or anger at me, for sure. Or just confused, like you don't even know what you think. What if I were to flip the pastor's statement around and say, there is a version of American progressivism that is trying to camouflage itself as Christianity, and it is a heretical version of our faith. How would that make you feel? Now, before you log off or storm out of the room um, or just send me a really angry email, um, by the way, all emails today go to Bethany Allen at Bridgetown.church. <laughs> I'm actually not here to talk about politics and sex. I'm here, I just want to make one simple point today. That's just an example of many. And my point is that we live in the age of ideology on both the right and the left. And I actually want to talk about what ideologies on both sides have in common. Ideologies are marked by two basic features. Number one, it's when you take a part of the truth and you make it the whole. So pretty much all ideologies start with a truth or a good idea, but then they make that one thing the whole thing, and in doing so, distort the original vision into a parody of itself. An easy example from the last century is the Russian Revolution. What started out by Marx and others as an erudite critique of classism and a vision of a society of equality and justice ended up, again, just at a, this is not opinion, just statistical level, as the greatest genocide in human history. Utopia became dystopia or the century before that, in our own country, what started out as a revolution of liberty ended in the greatest expression of chattel slavery in human history. You see, humans are a mixed bag, like all of us, Christian, atheists, and everything in between. We're, we're made in the image of God. We have latent goodness in us and wisdom and an impulse of love and relationship that is in all of us, and all of us are whatever language you want to use, fallen in Christian cliche, broke, hurt. We're just bent. And so no matter what our motivation is, without God, we ruin everything we touch. It's like we carry a disease and we attempt to heal and we just infect more and more and more with sin. Second, ideology is when you take a good thing and you make it ultimate. You take something like equality or justice or freedom or individualism or politics or a nation state all, in my opinion, good things. But when they become the ultimate thing, when they become de facto gods, at least at a functional level, that people put their faith in and give their allegiance to and need to be safe and happy, the result is always disaster. Because God is no longer in his rightful place as our ultimate. 
The common denominator in all ideologies is they put humanity and its ways and its moral reasoning and its autonomy from God at the center rather than God and his ways and his judgments of good and evil and his authority at the center. And we were created to live in orbit around God, not for anything else to live in orbit around the self. One is the path to heaven, the other the path to destruction. So they take a part of the truth and they make it the whole and they take a good thing and they make it ultimate. Now interesting, that is how a lot of Christian theologians define idolatry. Could it be that ideology is the idolatry of our era? Many cultural analysis over the last year or two have noted just the religious nature and tenor of ideologies, again, on both sides of the culture wars, they all, to pick your ideology of choice, they all have a gospel, they have a call to evangelism, they have a priesthood, they have conversion stories, they have members who have been initiated or baptized in, they have those who do not yet know the truth and need to be educated into it, they have dogma that you have to believe and you're not allowed to question or doubt or deviate from, they have false teachers and heretics, they have excommunication, they have eschatology, like a hope, a grand vision of the future, all of it. Ideologies often start out as theories or visions of a better society, but then evolve, again apart from God, into a metaphysical lens by which people see and interpret all of life. In that sense, they attempt to replace religion. They offer you an alternative means of identity and a sense of self-worth, even if it is a fragile and a performative one. They offer you a community of belonging, even if it is a tribal anti-community. They offer you a meaning and a purpose, even if it's not right. They offer an ethical vision of good and evil, a line of demarcation between the righteous and the wicked, who's in and who's out. They offer you a hope for a better tomorrow, for a society that is what we all crave, but all of it without God, or even against God, even if his name is still used. Decades ago, because it's not the real God, it's the figment of my imagination and my personal idol, God. Decades ago, Leslie Newbegin, the pastor turned cultural analysis, made the prediction that as the West secularized, religion would not go away. Rather, it would be transferred onto politics. And he meant that in the broad sense, not like practical ways to solve problems and injustice and stuff in our society, but what politics has become. He warned, the rise, warned of the rise of what he called the political religions. But what's confusing is that the ideologies of our day, or what Newbegin called the political religions, draw on Christian language and symbols. The West is still, as Faulkner said, haunted by Christ. In his excellent article, The Sad Irony of Celebrity Pastors, and I don't normally go in for like clickbaity, cynical pieces against celebrity pastors. They're way, like, that's not normally my jam. It's like easy journalism. But the journalist Ben Sixsmith writes, this was an excellent one, and he writes about the tragic moral failure of a well-known pastor, and he ties it not just to celebrityism, but to a larger trend in America, what he calls the with a twist of Christianity trend. Writing about this particular scandal, which was of a kind of neo-Pentecostal glamour kind of style of church, he writes there about this, there is mainstream culture, celebrities, fashion, music, modish political activism, and a message of self-love, but with a twist of Christianity. Then he writes, most people stick with mainstream culture because they can have all of those things and premarital sex, which is, that's funny, by the way. <laughs> we can see the with a twist of Christianity trend elsewhere, uh, writing about Jerry Falwell in context, was representative of the right-wing business-oriented evangelicals who offer capitalistic self-enrichment and hubristic jingoism with a twist of Christianity. Then there are progressive Christians who promote the usual left-wing causes with a twist of Christianity. While different in belief, such people share patterns of thought. The former believe secular individualists mysteriously share God's wishes for what should be done with money, while the latter think that secular progressives mysteriously share God's wishes for what should be done with bodies. 
So if Christianity is such an inessential add-on, why become a Christian? Listen to this. I am not religious, so it is not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. Still, if someone has a faith worth following, I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there is nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. You see, while the ideologies of our day are new, the temptation to mix the way of Jesus and what the writers of the New Testament called the way of this world is ancient. The age-old temptation of the people of God is not to atheism as much as it is to idolatry. It's not to God or, but God and. This is still, I just read in Exodus a few days ago that story of when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, and while he's away, the entire nation goes apostate, but it's so fascinating. They turn gold into a statue, and then they call that statue of the golden calves Yahweh, and they hold a festival to quote Yahweh, and then it said the people got up to indulge in revelry, which is Bible for Game of Thrones, right? It's just just like extreme sexual license, all under the name of we worship Yahweh because then he's behind you and you can do whatever the hell you want. And I mean that in the theological sense, not the crass sense. This is still going on thousands of years later where the name of Jesus is co-opted by ideologies from both sides that in all honesty are rival religions and antichrist. The temptation for most of us, as it was for ancient Israel, is to syncretism, to a kind of DIY faith that's a mix of Jesus and Sabbath and contemplative prayer and progressive sex ethics and Western individualism and consumerism. It's that New York Times article we read a few weeks ago or a few months ago uh, where he compared like cable bundling. I don't have a TV, but apparently they're like, Features now where you can like, I want ESPN, and I want HBO, and I want CBS, and I want to pick kind of mish and mash, and he called it religious bundling. I want a little Jesus, a little Buddha, a little mindfulness, a little neuroscience, a little, I just kind of want to put it all together and do my own thing. That's the great temptation for all of us. How do we live and follow Jesus in an age of ideology where the cacophony of sound, and particularly the digital space, is just like a torrent of noise and we're fragmented and pulled apart and people in our own church, in our own community that we love and are in friendship with are being swept away by the ideologies of both the right and the left and losing their faith in the process or at least their integrity. How do we follow Jesus and stay true to the way? 2 Corinthians 10 is a passage or a path forward for such a time as this. In context, if you've never read his letter to the Corinthians before, Paul is dealing with a group of false apostles who claim to be spiritual Christian leaders, but in reality are, this is a quote from the next chapter, false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, he writes then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. This is nothing new. This is ancient. Look again with me at verse 1 if your Bible is open. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. Note Paul's tone. There's no hate there. There's not even contempt or moral superiority He's widely, wildly at odds with the Corinthians, or at least a faction inside the Corinthian church, and their vision, their moral vision of reality. But he comes in a genuine spirit of humility and gentleness. The word appeal there in Greek means a polite request. It was official word used by like diplomats. He's not trying to coerce or to control people. He's calling people to Christ. I, Paul, who am timid when face-to-face with you, but bold toward you when away. Apparently, he wasn't like all that impressive in person. He was a bit of a diminutive uh, frame, but he was a bold, daring writer. And he's this beautiful blend of like kind and gentle and feisty and wicked smart. 
I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some, and I don't want to fight with you, towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. There were some in that church, as there are some in most every church, who actually think, they they are confused, and they think, and we all do this at times, that we live by the standards of this world, by the normal norms, by the social expectations, by the practices and the value set and what's normal in the world around us. Now, the world, if you're new to the scriptures, is a technical term in the New Testament. It's used first by Jesus and then it's picked up by Paul and Peter and the writers of the New Testament. The world in the New Testament is a system of ideas, first and foremost, and values and morals and practices and social norms in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. That's Genesis 3 in one sentence. Dallas Willard defined the world as our cultural and social practices that are under the control of Satan and thus opposed to God. Dr. Gary Bashir has said it this way, thank you, Gary, the world is Satan's domain where his authority and values reign, though his deception makes that hard to realize. Because if you are of the world, then it all seems right. Now, in our country, in 2021, there is a leftist version of the world, there is a right version of the world, there's even a church version of the world. But no matter what side of the culture wars we gravitate toward, we all feel the gravitational pull of the world. And we have to resist, and that is New Testament language, resist a kind of orbital decay in our discipleship to Jesus at the center. Paul goes on, for though we live in the world, we live right here, we live very much in the world, we're in Portland, Oregon, we're like on the edge of the map, right? We live right at probably the hotbed of ideology, maybe other than like the newsroom of the New York Times or something, Portland, Oregon. We're right at the center of ideology. But we do not wage war as the world does, right? This isn't like, I'm not calling you to like take America back from God or like get on Twitter and just go after it or what, not at all. We follow a rabbi who taught nonviolence and enemy love who gave his life rather than take life, who was willing to suffer but not willing to inflict harm even in the name of good. So we do not ever, ever resort to violence or even to contempt, which is not only socially acceptable in our city but is a virtue, or moral superiority or trolling on social media. We do not wage war as the world does. He goes on, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Meaning we don't just have intellectualism or even a moral reasoning or an emotional appeal with a heart touching story, all that's great. We have divine power. The Greek word there is dunamis, is where we get the word dynamite, an explosive, raw energy from God and his gospel, quote, to demolish, and that word can be translated deconstruct, more on that in a minute, the strongholds. The word here is acumura, it's a military fortification. There are strongholds. There are fortified positions of the enemy, not only in the world, but in the church. In every church, and in every heart, and in every mind, most likely including my own. Often what starts out as a foothold of the enemy, a lie that we come to believe, an opinion that we form, a habit that we give into, a compromise that we make a few times, a relationship that we let ourselves into, an environment that we're in on a regular basis. What starts as a foothold will often grow into a stronghold, a bastion of evil in your heart, your mind, your body, your community, your Bridgetown community, our church, our nation, the church in our nation, where the evil is so strong that our best attempts to dislodge and drive it out fail. Paul goes on to define strongholds as two things. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So number one, strongholds are arguments. The word here in Greek is logosmai. It means thoughts 
or thought patterns. It literally, it means words. It's the same word translated as the word or the word of God or ideas or idea matrices. And two, every pretension, the word here is hupsoma, and it's hard to translate into English. It more literally means exalted thing. Um, the ESV has every lofty opinion. Eugene Peterson translates it as warped philosophies. For our purposes, it's ideologies. So the strongholds, get this, the strongholds are not even people they're not some thing out there. They are ideas and ideologies that are animated by a demonic power and are anti-Christ, are set up against the knowledge of God and that enslave us under the dominion of the enemy rather than in the freedom of Christ. As Willard put it in Renovation of the Heart, ideas, not tyrants, are the primary stronghold of evil in the human soul and society. This is why we open the Bible every single week. More on that in a minute. Paul goes on to end by saying, we take captive. So we demolish or we deconstruct, we tear down strongholds, and then we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Note that for Paul, the battle for our soul and for the soul of the church is won or lost on the field of our mind. There is a war raging, not just out there on Twitter and the internet and on, on the streets of the cities, but there is a war raging in here, and it is not between the right and the left. It is between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, of which there is a red version and a blue version. As followers of Jesus, we wage war in our mind against ideas and ideologies in order to make, here's our end goal as disciples of Jesus, to make all of our life obedient to Christ. The word for this, all of our life obedient to Christ, that's been used for a very long time is the word orthodoxy. Ortho meaning right in Greek and doxa meaning belief, right belief. You may love that word, you may hate it, that's fine. It just means a body of ideas and ethics and practices that have been ta passed down from the life and the teachings of Jesus himself and the New Testament writers for at least 2,000 years. Yes, followers of Jesus disagree on all sorts of secondary issues. That's a whole other teaching series. And yes, the library of scripture is very clear about some things and not at all clear about other things. But there is a body of truth that we can safely say, we, not you, not I, we can safely say, this is what followers of Jesus believe. And this is how followers of Jesus live. It's not just the creed. Some people want to say it's just the Apostles' Creed, that's, which is beautiful. But that's not, a creed is not a summary of all Christian thought. It's an answer to heresy. Orthodoxy is broader than the creeds. It has to do with, the creeds say nothing about ethics. They say nothing about your body, nothing about your sexuality, nothing about your relationships, nothing about your money. Orthodoxy, or orthopraxy if you prefer, the biblical word for this, orthodoxy isn't actually a biblical word, so if you don't like it, that's fine. The biblical word for this is the way with a capital W. The way of Jesus. And orthodoxy, if you call it that, or the way, is a form of obedience to Christ in our mind and in our whole body. It is a form of allegiance to Jesus as Lord. That's what Christ means, King or Messiah or Lord. Put another way, in a little bit more language that we're comfortable with, it is a form of trusting surrender to love, which is the same thing as allegiance to Jesus as Lord. And the reality is, like, we are an orthodox church. Like, there's no hiding that. We've been talking about this a lot as leaders. We've been praying a lot for our time together this morning, knowing it will upset a lot of you. And I know that many of you are new to Jesus and many of you have had a bad experience in church in the past and you're trying to figure out what you even believe. And we work very hard, I know we fall short, we work very, we do our very best to lead and to teach with nuance and thoughtfulness and humility. But our leaders have come to realize that we need to just stop beating around the bush. We're not a progressive church, nor are we a conservative church and what that word has come to mean. We don't align with the left or the right. We are a Jesus church. Yes. And that makes us, in all honesty, at odds with aspects of both sides. 
we just are here because we love Jesus. There's lots of things in this world to follow and love. We're here because we follow and love Jesus. And we trust his wisdom and his stunning intelligence and his genuine goodness. We find his life and his teachings to be the most compelling and deep resonance of truth, like vision of life on offer. We love prayer. We love to just sit and rest in God's love and experience his presence and listen and surrender to his will over our life and and attempt through prayer and fasting and disciplines and life together to make our bodies the place where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We love scripture. We ache not just to read a little section of it on Sunday or not even to understand it and not even to agree with it, but to own it and live in it and live it out. And while we are quick to apologize for all of the ways that we do not measure up to Jesus' example, and there are so many examples of that in my own life, in our church, and in all honesty, in every single one of you in the room. God bless you all. But we do not apologize for our love of Jesus and our allegiance to him as Lord and our trust in the scriptures as the word of God. Because for us, Jesus is more than just a really smart rabbi or a cool social activist way before his time. He is the Lord of all creation. He is the Christ King whom God raised from the dead and set at the right hand of the universe, who one day will return to put the world to rights and will judge the wicked and the righteous and will eradicate every every trace of, of evil from our bodies and our society and will reign forever. And we want to be there and we want to get in on that reign now as we surrender to Jesus one daily death and decision to yield at a time. This is who we are. Now, I know this is a lot to swallow. This is, this is like, yes, for some of you and like, I'm done for others of you. This is a lot to swallow. We are living in a generation-wide crisis of deconstruction. All around us, people, including in our own church that we love, again, are just being swept away by the ideas and ideologies of our time. Um, Next week, on March 3rd, we're hosting a live stream lecture with Dr. Ajoe Sabota, who's a friend of ours, and his new book, After Doubt, How to Question Your Faith Without Losing It, which is all about like deconstruction and how to do it well. But let me just speak to deconstruction for a few moments. The first thing that must be said about deconstruction, because there's no way to talk about orthodoxy and not talk about the fact that we're living through a generation-wide movement to deconstruct orthodoxy. The first thing that must be said about deconstruction is that there is a good type of deconstruction that we see, and there's a need for it. Every generation has a need for it. This is the type that you see in Jesus himself who made a radical critique of the religious leaders of his day and the way that human traditions had corrupted biblical truth. It's the the deconstructionism of the Hebrew prophets, of the martyrs and the saints down through church history, of the reformers, many of whom died at the hand of Christian religious leaders. This is not a new problem. This is the type of deconstruction where Jesus and others use scripture to critique the world's corruption of the church. But then there is another type of deconstruction, that of Western millennials, who use the world to critique scripture's authority over the church. The former is the way of Jesus, and we want to actually do that. It's what's caused us to rethink a lot of issues from military violence, to the role of women in the church, to how we read scripture. It's caused us to rethink lots of, to politics, lots of things. But the latter is not the way of Jesus. The second thing that must be said about deconstruction is that is the middle of a process of maturation. It is not the end goal. So just set religion aside. Developmental psychologists talk about a three-stage process. Stage one is construction. In your childhood and your family of origin, you are handed the building, in theory, 
you are handed the building blocks for a worldview along with a template and you construct one. That is good and it is healthy, but it tends to be, unless if you're like a budding Aristotle, it tends to be very black and white. It's rigid in stage one. Most of us are self-righteous. We think we know way more than we actually know. We think life is a lot more black and white and clear cut than it actually is. We don't have a lot of capacity to to wrestle honestly with the ambiguity of the human condition, right? Then deconstruction, as you become an adult, you realize all the problems and issues with your worldview, all the ways the template that you were handed was skewed or it was biased by your culture or your ethnic background or whatever, and then we start to question and doubt and probe and search after the truth. What was I handed that's good and beautiful and true, and what was I handed that, that is corrupted by sin? Then comes reconstruction, stage three, as you rebuild a worldview of mental maps to live by based on the best wisdom of previous generations. Billions of people have done life before us. We don't need to start with a blank slate. We don't have to learn all of these lessons from scratch. We don't have to destroy our lives and wreck our marriages and harm our bodies and destroy our nervous system's capacity for intimacy just because we want to find out for ourselves. Other people have made those mistakes. If we will humble ourselves, if we will read, if we will study, if we will adopt the posture of an apprentice, then we can be spared so much pain. Right, And we can reconstruct a worldview based on the best wisdom of past generations, but one that we now own, that has been purged and purified, that we now own with humility and with wisdom and with conviction. Stage three is what the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur called a second naivete. It's almost like what you see in a child where a child is just like really naive and happy, but like on the other side of walking through the desert wasteland of modern skepticism and now old and wise and experienced and with scars and having gone down the rabbit trail and, and been through the full gamut of emotions, we come back to a new place of humble, trusting joy. Now, we live in a stage one and a stage two culture. There's very little stage three. There's a conservative version of stage one that I grew up in, bumper sticker, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Just missing one little thing that you have to interpret the Bible person. Um, it doesn't allow space for doubt or questions or emotion or, or, or data points that don't align with the theological system. It confuses one's interpretation of the Bible with the Bible itself. And therefore, as good as it often is, it's corrupted by human fallenness. Then there's a progressive version of stage one all around us where people parrot the fad lingo of various ideologies. People unthinkingly accept ideas that are full of contradiction and bias just because everybody's saying it on Instagram. And just like conservatives do not allow space for doubt or questions. You are labeled a heretic and you are shamed if you dare to even question the dogma. But overall, we're in a stage two culture where a lot of people kind of move through that and you can only stay zealous for so long and then get stuck in a kind of limbo, more against certain things than for anything specific, more doubt than faith, more skepticism than confidence. Very few of us are stage three, those beautiful people who have a deep conviction about God and scripture and reality and morality but they also have a high capacity for just how strange and broken and confusing and ambiguous the human condition is. And they live with a high capacity for paradox and with a deep humility and wisdom and compassion, but also with a burning conviction. These people exist, and some are even in the room this morning, but they are in small number. All that to say, deconstruction is not the end goal, and you need to realize that. It's not the be-all, end-all. Like if you're in that phase, it's, it's a phase that you need to, I need to, just to develop as a human, move through. And if you're in that process, please, like I know that the church in general has not done a good job of holding space for those in that. We, just, we just don't, our fear, our ego will come in and we will react when people have doubts and questions or push back or challenge authority. 
I'm so sorry for any wrong that's been done to any of you. I've been through that all. I have very much been through that. And it was hurtful. And it's hard. And we want to be there for you. Please reach out to our pastoral team. Let us walk with you. Don't walk through the desert of modern skepticism alone. Goodness. There's a whole tribe of us in the desert. Let's walk through it together. And with some guides who have been through the other side and come back to say, there's an oasis waiting for you. Just keep walking. Keep, the, as, as the ancients used to say, keep the faith. Don't give up. Then the last thing that must be said about deconstruction is that it's much more complex than a simple kind of orthodox or you know, heretical kind of binary. There is no one size fits all paradigm, but as I see it, and this is just my pastoral perspective, deconstruction is the access point between three external factors and three internal. At the external level, it's the confluence of one, a kind of what Bonhoeffer called a cheap grace culture or a low discipleship culture that is more interested in making converts than making apprentices to Jesus. Two, then you have ascendant secular ideologies, again, on both sides that both attempt, that are quasi-religions that attempt to replace the way of Jesus and are not just held by elites, but are spread by the digital IV into our mind stream and educated into us by the school system, pop culture, and capitalist marketing departments. Then three, you have the tragic breakdown of trust in spiritual leaders. Just this week, another story broke or was confirmed of Rabbi, Z- Rabbi Zacharias, who we thought, I thought was like one of the good ones. He was like one of the smart, kind of likable ones, but gross social, so sexual misconduct. How many stories can a generation take of that, of scandal, before all trust in spiritual leaders is burned up? Why would you ever trust me when all you have to do is Google pastor failing page after page after page? So at the external, you have a low discipleship culture, aggressive secular ideologies, and a lot of distrust. Then at an internal level, you have first off a lack of the fear of God, generation-wide. And with it, a lack of surrender to God's fierce love. You have a Christianity without a cross. The result is an undisciplined flesh or an undiscipled flesh that is coddled and given free reign rather than conquered by the Spirit's power. Then you have a mind, number two, that is full of digital inputs rather than saturated in scripture and in prayer. The Barner Group report, the stats about a year old, that the average millennial consumes over 3,000 hours of digital con- content a year, and only a hundred, this is for strong Christian millennials, only 150 of which is Christian. That is a 20 to one ratio. This is key to realize because as Hui Hui Tan put it, you become what you contemplate. You become what you give your attention to. If your ratio of secular ideas to Jesus' truth is 20 to one, that is going to have a corrosive effect on your faith, full stop. Then finally, and I say this in a tender spirit, you have a wounded, you have a wounded heart. I know almost no people who have deconstructed their faith who were not first wounded by a spiritual leader, or by a church, or a Christian experience, or by their family of origin, or by a mom or a dad who was a Christian but was all wacky or painful, or, or by just the pain of, in all honesty, singleness and loneliness. A lot of people I know deconstruct out of the pain of not being able to find a Christian spouse to go through life with, or just the pain and the trauma of the, of the right or the left's corruption of the church. AJ, in his book, is beautiful, writes about what he calls the New Oregon Trail, which is this pattern where people from the South or the Midwest or more conservative cultures had a, have a bad experience or hurtful experience in a conservative church. They draw, they're drawn to Portland, they move here, they get here, it's like crazy far left, super secular, anything goes, and they're here for a while and they're away from all of their like family relational structures and church structures and they're a little confused and they just get sucked in and they end up deconstructing first kind of church and then Bible orthodoxy and then most, not always, but most of the time, I would say in the over 90% of the range, they go from progressive Christian to post-Christian. And they're just kind of out there in the, you know, I don't know where they are. The New Oregon Trail but almost always behind that is a hurt, a wound. 
Experts on deliverance ministry talk about double trauma, how emotional wounds are often portals for demonic attack in our life. And they call it a double trauma because you have the original trauma of something painful that happened to you, whether it be assault or a breakdown or a divorce or a spiritual abuse or just something gnarly or just something painful but more normal. And then demonic beings then come in at your greatest point of vulnerability and begin to plant lies about your identity, about your self-worth, about the trustworthiness of other people, about the goodness or validity of God or scripture or the church, and begin to just afflict your soul from the inside out. That is a tragedy. And if you're living through that, please don't. We love you. We're so sorry. Let us pray with you. Let us weep with you. Let us live with you. But together, the lack of a fear of God, a mime that is just caught up in the noise and the din of the world and a wounded heart just become an easy prey for the wicked one. Now, for those of you who are in deconstruction as we speak, this is not my attempt to label you. Please do not interpret it that way. This has been a testing year for all of our faith. It's been really disheartening to see corruption on both sides. This is just my appeal, as Paul called it. Please, like, don't let your heart be taken captive by the enemy. Return to the love of God. There is nothing better than the love of God. And to the rest of us who are just trying to figure it out in Portland and follow Jesus, it's an appeal to guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life, and to not go it alone. This is the call of Paul in the text. First, Paul calls out that these ideas and ideologies are often animated by demonic power. And then he calls on us as followers of Jesus to demolish slash deconstruct, to aim. All of us have this like deconstructionist impulse, like this little punk rocker in all of us, right? And that's actually, there's a good part of that. He calls us to aim that deconstructionist impulse not at the orthodoxy of the way of Jesus, but at the ideologies of the world. Now, as we wind down, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. By almost done, I mean 30 more minutes. Um, <laughs> Is there a practice, I know this is long, thank you for your patience. Is there a practice from the way of Jesus to index our hearts away from their captivity to ideology and toward freedom of the way of Jesus? To, in Paul's language, to demolish strongholds of the enemy in our heart. Yes, there are many, but at the top of that list is scripture. Scripture is a library of writings that are both human and divine that together tell a unified story that leads us to Jesus. Jesus himself was a rabbi or in our language, a Bible teacher. His mind was saturated in scripture. He would teach it, quote it, pray it, obey it, live it. He was obedient to scripture as a form of surrender to the Father's love. For him, this is really clear when you read Jesus, it was way more than like interesting literature. It was God-breathed truth. In reading Moses or David or Isaiah, he was reading God's word over his life. He would say things like, the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David and quote from the Psalms. He would say, God said and quote from Moses. He would say, scripture cannot be broken. He would say, not one dot of the I or cross of the T will ever be broken until all of these things are accomplished. And then God raised Jesus from the dead as God's vindication of Jesus' teachings as reality. Just to clarify the, lo the moral logic here, we do not trust in Jesus because of the Bible. We do not believe what we believe about Jesus because I read it in the Bible. We trust in the Bible, be that's backwards logic. This is the circular reasoning. We trust in the Bible because of Jesus, because there was a man who three days later came back from the dead after saying things that no one had really ever said and offering a vision of life that was without parallel and still is without parallel, we think, in human history. Then he came back from the dead, and this man taught the Bible, loved the Bible, and said this was scripture. So we're like, okay, we're... <laughs> We have lots of questions about the Bible, but we follow you, Jesus, and so help us and have mercy and let's, let's get into this and do it. For us as followers of Jesus, I love the Bridgetown, like, almost clap. It's like, we're, no, it's like, no, I'm not asking for a clap. That's such us. We're like charismatic, but not really Pentecostal, but we're Portlanders, but it's winter. We're like, yeah, that's us. I love you. I love you so much. 
For us as followers of Jesus, our aim isn't just to read scripture or even to know it or even to agree with it, but to obey it as an act of faith in Jesus. But more than that, scripture for us is a vehicle for abiding in Jesus. Jesus, in one of my favorite passages, said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He's talking about the flow of consciousness through our mind, our inner woman or man. All of us have that flow of consciousness. All of us have words or ideas that flow through our mind or inner being all day long. To let Jesus' word abide in us is to let his words, his ideas, his truth, his love and wisdom flow through our mind stream all day long and give shape to the inner architecture of our heart. It's about consciousness. Our apprenticeship to Jesus, therefore, must curate our mind stream, must begin, not end, but begin in our mind. It must guard our mind against the ideas and ideologies that are set against the knowledge of God, which for us in our age means strict discipline around our phones and social media and the internet and TV and quality, frequency, and moral tenor. But we must also guide our mind into truth, not just by reading, but by living in Scripture, in the flow of our consciousness. There is no right way to read Scripture. You can read a small section, slowly and prayerfully, what some call Lectio Divina, or you can read or listen to a large swath of Scripture at once. You can do it alone. You can do it with a community. That, by the way, is how much of Scripture was designed to be experienced in a community sitting through an entire literary work in one sitting, You can study it, you can analyze it one word at a time, you can listen to teachings on it, you can memorize it, you can pray it, all sorts of ways to engage scripture. We have a practice for you that you can work through with your Bridgetown community up at bridgetown.church slash future as we continue to develop our rule of life. We have multiple levels of engagement for you. Everything we do is invitational. We make invitations, you make decisions. But the baseline rule of life that we wanna to get to down the road is that we invite you to now, and, or at least to work toward, is to commit to the daily reading of scripture and to self-imposed limits on screen time and intake of entertainment in quantity, frequency, and moral nature. To end, contrary to popular opinion, and I really do mean to end right now, I promise. Um, you know, faith is not a religious thing. It's a human thing. We all live by faith. There's no way to not live by faith because we're all trying to get somewhere that we have never been. Call that the good life or happiness or the American dream or a society of equality and justice or call it the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus. We're all trying to get to something like that. The problem is we've never been there. And so we have to rely on the mental maps of something or someone who is ahead of us on the spiritual journey who has been there and knows the way, but we've not been there. So we have to find a guide, not just a map, but a guide who is trustworthy and true, and then we have to live by faith in his mental maps to how we get to the life that all of us, religious or not, crave. So the question is not do you live by faith? You do. All of us do. It's who or what do you put your faith in? The culture tells us to put our faith in ourself, in our inner barometer of good and evil, our inner intuitions, feelings, and desires. To follow your heart and speak your truth, we are told every single day. That is the path, so we are told, to human flourishing. Of course, the reality is that politicians... And marketing departments and elites the world over have a vested interest in us believing this because it keeps us blind to just how much of that inner barometer has actually been shaped by their desires to profit off of us, not our deepest desires in our own heart. It's behavioral economics masquerading as be true to yourself individualism. And the signs are all around us that our culture's mental maps are off kilter. Just walk around the city and open your eyes. It's just there. But what is it that we all want? No two people are the same, but almost all of us, we just want to be happy. We want to give and receive love. We want to feel safe. We want to live with meaning and purpose. We know that suffering is inevitable, but we want less of it. 
And, and, and we want to know that our suffering has some meaning. And we want to know that we can face death without fear. And we want to know that there's something more than just survival of the fittest, fittest and Darwinian dog-eat-dog. Ignatius of Loyola defines sin as unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. To turn that around, obedience to Jesus and his way is willingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. Do you trust Jesus? Do I? What would the next step of trust look like for you, for me? We are a community of orthodoxy and a culture of ideological idolatry. It doesn't mean we don't ask questions. It doesn't mean we don't have doubts. It doesn't mean we don't screw up and suffer our way through. It just means we're people who live by faith and falter and help each other get back up and live by faith in Jesus' mental maps of reality. Trust him, the good shepherd, the pastor, to lead us and guide us to the life that we all desire. We are people who are human and finite and deeply flawed, but who love and follow Jesus, the way, the truth, 